Okay, um, my name is Moxie Marlinspike. I'm from the Institute for Disruptive Studies. Uh, I don't really like introductions, so I wanted to take this time to introduce uh, somebody else, uh, two friends of mine, who are probably my, two of my favorite people in the world. Uh, we're hiking through Kurdish Iraq, and we're kidnapped by the Iranian military. And uh, as of this Saturday, they will have been in Iranian prison for exactly one year. Um, so anyway, I, I think about them all the time, and uh, I just want other people to know that there are uh, people you know, stuck in jail in Iran. Uh, but today I want to uh, take some time to think about privacy. Um, and what I want to do is start by looking into the past, thinking about the things that uh, we thought were important, the threats that we thought we faced, uh, the things that we thought were worth working on. And then I want to take some time to uh, talk about how I think trends have sort of changed and then look into the future of things that I think are going to be important moving forward, um, things that I'm interested in working on and perhaps other people might be interested in working on as well. So uh, looking into the past, the sort of technology narrative of the 90s was largely dominated by this thing, the web browser, right? When Netscape first introduced Netscape Navigator, it was almost revolutionary. And a lot of people moved to immediately capitalize on that knowledge. Uh, one of the major players that wanted to protect their interests were uh, Microsoft. And so they introduced Internet Explorer. And at that moment, the, the technology narrative was transformed from uh, more than just the web browser to this war between web browsers, uh, the browser wars. And uh, we all know how that turned out. Um, but at the same time, there was another war that was happening, and it was just as fierce um, and perhaps more important, although um, much more subtle. And it was a war over this thing, uh, the little lock icon in your web browser, and more importantly, the technology and the ideas behind it. On one side of this war were the cypherpunks. Uh, these were people who wanted to um, promote this information and distribute it widely so that many people could use it. And on the other side of this war were the eavesdroppers. Uh, these are people who wanted to prevent the spread of this information. They wanted to uh, control these ideas so that not many people could use them. And so the lines were drawn. And on the cypherpunk side, you had people like Matt Blaze, Philip Zimmerman, Ian Goldberg, David Shaw, and Timothy May, the heroes of my teenage years. And the eavesdroppers thought that these people were dangerous in fact, their ideas scared the fuck out of them. <laughs> they were talking about the move from a world where the eavesdroppers had ultimate control and access to all information to a world where they would have no control and no access to any information. And in fact, uh, they thought that these ideas were so dangerous that they classified them as weapons. Uh, if you were to write a little bit of crypto code and send it to your friend in Canada, uh, that was tantamount to exporting munitions and you could be tried and prosecuted as such. At the same time, uh, you know, the government uh, realized that uh, these ideas around privacy uh, could be important, uh, you know, that people might uh, want this privacy thing. And uh, so they decided that they needed their own um, solution. And so they came up with this idea um, called uh, Key Escrow, and it was uh, best embodied by uh, this, this chip, the Clipper chip. And the idea was they wanted to embed this chip in every piece of consumer communications electronics. Every telephone, every fax machine, every computer would have one of these in it. And it's a little, you know, uh, uh, closed circuit and uh, it does cryptography for you and allows you to communicate securely. Uh, the only catch is that uh, then the government has the equivalent of a master key which they can then use to uh, decrypt anything that they wanted to read. Um, and so their problem was that cryptography is not a banana, which is to say that uh, it is difficult to treat information as an object, uh, that uh, if I have a banana and I share it with uh, one person, there is still only one banana in the world. If they share it with another person, there is still only one banana in the world. Uh, if, however, I share an idea with somebody or information with somebody, then uh, now there are two copies and each time somebody shares something, there's the potential for an exponential explosion. And uh, so this was made worse for them uh, by the cypherpunks mantra, cypherpunks write code. 
Uh, a lot of good work had been done in academia in developing uh, you know, public key cryptography and um, crypto, crypto systems outside of uh, government circles. Uh, but the cypherpunks wanted actual software that people could use, uh, things that people would download and run to communicate securely right now. And so they kind of went nuts. Uh, some people moved to Anguilla, which is an island in the Caribbean that has very favorable laws in terms of exporting cryptography, and they you know, went there to write crypto code and send it throughout the world. Other people had uh, some more creative strategies. Uh, in 1995, uh, Philip Zimmerman, in conjunction with MIT Press, published this book called PGP Source Code and Internals. And the deal was it's just the PGP source code printed into a book in a machine-readable font. Because uh, the deal is that digital representations of cryptography are weapons, but if you print it in a book, then that's speech. <laughs> and, and so they just printed the book, a very small print run, and then you know, mailed it everywhere in the world that they wanted uh, cryptography. And then those people just scanned it back in because it was a machine-readable font, and now everybody had PGP. Um, so anyway, these, these strategies continued, and people were you know, very successful in distributing cryptography throughout the world. And uh, you know, people uh, ramped up their efforts more and more. And then in 2000, suddenly, uh, the Clinton administration uh, repealed all of the significant laws um, regulating the export of cryptography. And it sort of seemed like the game was over, that the world was won, uh, that the cypherpunks had won this war. And if you go back and you look at their predictions, um, their first prediction, their sort of ultimate prediction, turned out to be incredibly prescient, right? Which is just that cryptography would inevitably become ubiquitous. Um, and this was one of the first times that we saw that information really does want to be free. Uh, that, uh, inform it's, that it's hard to control. But then if you go and you look at their predictions of what would happen once cryptography was ubiquitous, um, they're somewhat less prescient. Um, that anonymous digital cash would flourish, that intellectual property would disappear, that uh, surveillance would become impossible, uh, that governments would be unable to co continue collecting taxes, and that eventually governments would fall, all from the distribution of crypto cryptography. If we flash forward 10 years from you know, the, sort of the mark of these predictions, cryptography is the thing that allows you to securely transmit your credit card number to Amazon.com so you can buy a copy of Sarah Palin's book, On Going Rogue. Um, yeah, sure, uh, you know, some of these things have been eroded, uh, but surveillance is probably at an all-time high, and privacy is probably at an all-time low. So what happened, you know? Uh, we thought we were, you know, engaged in this war, and it seemed like we won, and here we are in this strange situation. Um, well, I think my sort of thesis here is that in many ways, I feel like the cypherpunks were preparing for a future. Uh, and the future that they anticipated was fascism. Um, but what we got was social democracy. And it's not necessarily better, it's just different. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, how many people here would feel good about a law that required everyone to carry government-mandated tracking devices on them at all times? You, one person, you, you have to leave. <laughs> uh, you're not welcome here. Yeah, pretty much nobody, right? Nobody feels good about that law. So that's fascism, right? That's, that's the fascist world that the cypherpunks anticipated. Now let me ask another question. Um, how many people here uh, carry a cell phone? Right. Everybody, pretty much. I'm, I'm guessing everybody in this room carries a cell phone. And that's social democracy, right? But so ultimately, what is the difference between a government-mandated tracking device and a cell phone, right? I mean, logistically, they're the same. Your cell phone uh, records your real-time position and reports that to a telecommunications company that is required by law to turn that information over to the government. So what is the difference between a government-mandated tracking device and a cell phone? I mean, no difference, right? Like, if we were all supposed to be carrying government-mandated tracking devices, we'd be riding in the streets right now, but we're not riding in the streets, so why? But you do, ah, choice. There you go. You choose to carry a cell phone, whereas you know, the government would make you do this other thing. So let's talk about choice. Um, never 
in my wildest dreams did I think that I would have a cell phone. I mean, why would I? You know, there are these mobile tracking devices, there are uh, mobile bugs, you know, they uh, operate over an insecure protocol. And yet I do. I have one, and I carry it with me all the time. I have it with me right now. Um, well, I think if we look at the way that people tend to organize and communicate in groups, uh, often there are uh, sort of informal connections that allow people to communicate and collaborate that uh, bind people together. And if you introduce sort of a more codified communications channel, there's this well-known problem called the no-network effect, where now if I invent this thing and I start using it, um, my problem is that if I'm the only one using it, it's not really worth very much, that the value of a, a network is in the number of nodes that are connected to it. If, however, I somehow manage to get everyone to start using my communications network, then it becomes very valuable. But there's a side effect, which is that the old uh, informal mechanisms for communication and collaboration are destroyed. That technology actually changes the fabric of society. So then what happens is there's the inverse problem, where now if I decide that I don't want to uh, participate in this new codified communications channel, once again, I am uh, struck by the, the no network effect. Because essentially, I am now choosing to be a part of a different network, the old network, that has been destroyed. It, it no longer really exists. Those channels aren't there anymore. And you know, it's easy to see how technology changes the fabric of society. I mean, there are very trivial examples that you look, and look at with cell phones. Right? Like people used to make plans. You know, they would say, I'll meet you at this time at the street corner, and we'll do this thing. And now people say, I'll call you when I get off work. And so if you don't have this technology, you can't really participate in, uh, in society in that sense, right? So yeah, I made, I made a choice to have a cell phone, but what kind of choice did I make, right? And I, so I think that this is how it basically goes, is that uh, there is this push to expand the scope of the choices that we have to make. The choice starts off very simple, right? Do I have a piece of consumer electronics in my pocket or not? And that slowly, over time, the scope of that choice continues to expand until I'm making a choice of whether to participate in society or not. That on some level today, to have a cell phone or not have a cell phone is becoming a choice to be a part of society or not be a part of society. And that's a much bigger choice than just do I have this piece of electronics or not. Um, so I think if we start looking at this pattern of small choices that become big choices, uh, you really start to see it everywhere. Um, one of my most favorite recent examples is from this uh, Firefox add-on called Adblock Plus. Um, I'm sure people are familiar with this. The, the basic way that it works is that uh, it allows you to block uh, ads uh, in your web browser, and, and it does that by allowing you to specify a, a list of regular expressions uh, that, uh, that describe URLs that are likely to be ad, ad network URLs. And so the problem is, right, uh, you can pretty accurately describe the, all the URLs you want to block, but you know, these URLs are sort of changing on some regular basis, and so um, it could be a pain to try and keep up with uh, these URLs as they change. And so they've done this pretty smart thing where they allow you to subscribe to lists of regular expressions to block, and then other people maintain those lists. Uh, and so you know, some people are sort of on it, maintaining the list, and everyone else benefits from uh, these updates. And uh, so this is used also for other things beyond just ads, right? Like um, I'm subscribed to a list that blocks trackers. So these are you know, web bugs that track your movements around the web. And there's somebody who maintains this list of uh, trackers to block. And of course, one of the uh, trackers that I'm most interested in blocking is uh, Google Analytics, right? because you know, that's not bad at all. Um, and something interesting happened where one day, 